Great. Hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this webinar on interstate commerce and cannabis. And also welcome to the Cannabis Research Center at UC Berkeley. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Cannabis Research Center, you can view all of our research and sign up for our monthly newsletter at our website at crc.berkeley.edu. I want to specifically thank um, Berkeley's Social Science Matrix and the Resources Legacy Fund for making today possible. And a specific thank you to Joanna Hasek, JD, for driving the organization of this panel, and also to Laura Herrera for facilitating its execution. Today, we're discussing the topic of interstate commerce and cannabis with an esteemed and knowledgeable panel of experts. I'm pleased to hand over moderation to Tamar Todd, JD, of UC Berkeley School of Law. She's worked at the cusp of policy, law, and academia for many years, and is most recently the author of a report with the Parabola Center on federal legalization, interstate commerce, and enduring matters of justice and equity. As we get started, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A in the chat during the discussion, and we're going to be collecting them for inclusion toward the end of the webinar. And then also, please know that the webinar today is going to be recorded and posted to the CRC website so the people who couldn't make it today can benefit from the knowledge shared. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and stay tuned for future events. With that, I'll hand it over to Tamar. Thank you, Michael, um, and welcome all. And thank you to the Berkeley Cannabis Research Center for hosting this event and to all of our expert speakers for participating and sharing their knowledge and insights today. Um, today, as Michael said, we're going to talk about the, about interstate commerce and what it means for cannabis markets and regulation now and in the future. Um, <clears throat> as, as many folks on this call and attending the webinar, I'm sure know that non-hemp legal cannabis markets are currently all intrastate. Um, because cannabis remains illegal under federal law, states have generally liberalized their cannabis laws by removing state law penalties and creating entirely intrastate markets. Um, in choosing this path, states have followed past Department of Justice guidelines that deprioritized enforcement of federal cannabis laws in states that did not import or export cannabis across state lines. And many states have used um, this chance at inter intrastate markets to their advantage um, to favor interstate, uh, their own resident businesses, to foster small businesses, develop social equity programs, and advance some very state-specific policy goals. However, interstate markets uh, and this requirement has also caused big problems and huge headaches for many states, including California, in a number of ways. Um, but these intrastate markets are likely to come to an end. Their legality is questionable under the Dormant Commerce Clause, there's ongoing litigation challenging them and federal legalization is somewhere on the horizon um, and will eventually turn everything on its head likely. Um, why the markets are the way they are, how they may change and what will happen when they do is the focus of the conversation today. And with that, I will introduce our speakers. Um, with us today, we have Robert Mykos, professor of law at Vanderbilt University Law School. Jillian Schauer, the Executive Director of the Cannabis Regulators Association. Jason Horst, Board President um, of the International Cannabis Bar Association. Ross Gordon, who is co-founder of the National Craft Cannabis Coalition. And Matthew Lee, who's General Counsel with the California Department of Cannabis Control. Um, each one of our experts is gonna talk to us for about four minutes um, and give some general introductory remarks. Then we'll move into a facilitated conversation. And at the end, I promise there will be time and a chance for audience questions of the experts. So with that, I will turn it over to Robert. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you also to the, the Berkeley Center for hosting this event uh, and including me. Uh, I am Rob Mykos. I, I teach at Vanderbilt here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I write a lot about the federalism issues uh, confronting uh, state policy developments, especially in uh, the cannabis law space. Uh, and I've been asked to give you sort of a, a very rough crash course in a key doctrine that has a lot of relevance here uh, to those intrastate markets uh, that Tamar uh, described to you. Uh, and that's really the Dormant Commerce Clause. 
Uh, and to, to simplify a bit, you can think of the Dormant Commerce Clause as basically a free trade agreement across the 50 states. Uh, the basic idea is simple. Um, if you have a business located in one state, let's say California, uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause says you are allowed to sell your wares anywhere within the 50 states. You don't have to worry about quotas. You don't have to worry about embargoes or tariffs being erected by other states. Um, that quote that I gave you here uh, from the Supreme Court in an old famous Dormant Commerce Clause case nicely describes sort of the rationale behind the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, it, it's really why when you walk into a grocery store in California, you're going to see avocados on the shelf that might have been grown in Florida or oranges that might have been grown in Arizona. Um, the state of California can't keep those competing commodities from other states out of uh, its stores. Um, if we can move on to the, the next slide, um, there are some, some key rules uh, behind the, the Dormant Commerce Clause that it's useful to be familiar with. Courts will basically divide state regulations into two different categories. Um, the most suspect type of state regulations are the ones that are discriminatory. They treat inside businesses different from outside businesses. In other words, state laws that discriminate against outsiders, those state laws are almost always unconstitutional. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that that's essentially what states are doing now with respect to cannabis. All of the states that have legalized cannabis, non-hemp cannabis for medical or adult use, all of them right now discriminate against outsiders. They say, if you want to sell your product within the state, you have to grow it, you have to process it within this state. Um, those sort of uh, rules are typically invalid under the Dormant Commerce Clause. The Dormant Commerce Clause also can be used to invalidate other neutral state regulations, ones that treat insiders and outsiders the same, although it's easier for states to defend these rules. So you could imagine California adopting a, a labeling rule. Uh, California is saying, if you want to sell avocados here, fine. We don't care that they're grown in Florida, but you have to affix on them a special label. Um, that's supposed to inform consumers about the nutritional content of your avocados. Um, you can do that as long as the burdens that that places on interstate commerce don't exceed whatever local benefits, legitimate local benefits you're trying to pursue. So the Dormant Commerce Clause can be used to invalidate really any state law that impedes interstate commerce, but it's especially uh, 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 scrutinizes those laws that discriminate against outsiders. Um, it's easier to defend the, the more neutral regulations. Now, this all has important ramifications for cannabis because, as Tamar described, every state is doing something now that, that would be unheard of in the, any other market. They're discriminating blatantly against interstate commerce. And so if the Dormant Commerce Clause applies to the cannabis market, these state restrictions on their state commerce are going to come tumbling down. And that's going to make the lives of state regulators a lot more complicated. Um, because right now they're trying to create these closed loop systems where everything that's sold within the state is also grown and processed within the state. Well, you won't be able to do that if the Dormant Commerce Clause applies. Uh, you'll have to start taking in product from other states, and state regulators are going to need to figure out some way of incorporating that outside product and dealing with um, many more vendors than they've had to deal with in the past. It's also going to have ramifications, for example, for, for local social equity programs, uh, because those social equity programs, as they've been constructed right now by the states, they typically require, rely on a form of geographic discrimination. So a state might say, if you were arrested in the past by the state uh, and you are now a resident of the state, um, we will give you a, a bonus when it comes to applying for a cannabis license. We'll give you some more points. Maybe we'll set aside some licenses uh, for you. But again, to the extent that those social equity programs rely on geographic discrimination, 
Um, they say, okay, you have to be somebody, let's say, who lives in an area where we've had a, a disproportionate number of arrests historically. Um, that's also going to be suspect under the Dormant Commerce Clause. It's another form of geographic discrimination. Um, there are lots of other ramifications of this, but the, the key point to, to get across here is that the Dormant Commerce Clause would clearly invalidate a lot of what the states have done in the cannabis law space um, if it applies to the states. Uh, and it's something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, um, don't fully understand, uh, and could really catch them by surprise. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Robert. And we'll move on to um, Julianne now. Great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jillian Schauer. I'm the executive director of the Cannabis Regulators Association. Um, I'm one of the non-lawyers on this panel. I have a PhD in behavioral science and public health, but um, I'm not a don't have a legal background and don't play a lawyer on TV. So just um, bear that in mind. Um, if you can go to the next slide, just want to give a brief overview of the Cannabis Regulators Association. Um, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit association of government agencies that are involved in cannabis or cannabinoid regulation. Um, we have 44 states, the District of Columbia, two U.S. territories, Canada, and the Netherlands in our membership. We're not an advocacy group. We're really focused on education and convening um, government agencies to talk about this issue. Our, our funding is mostly from member agencies. We have no non-governmental membership or donations. Um, and you can see the, the uh, map with our states listed there. We have talked a lot about interstate commerce at CANRA. Um, it's something that regulators in every state and jurisdiction are thinking carefully about. Um, to different extents, as you'll hear later from Matt. I uh, want to make it clear, though, the comments that I have on this webinar are mine and not an official position of CANRA or any of our member states. So next slide, I want to just remind everybody as we go into this discussion that we already have interstate commerce of cannabinoids, um, and it would be naive not to recognize that we do. And we have it through a number of different channels now. We have it from um, hemp drive cannabinoids that became federally legal through the 2018 Farm Bill, um, and now are all over e-commerce and um, you know grocery stores, gas stations, you name it. We have it through the legacy unregulated market that's existed in um, many states for decades upon decades. And we have it in what I would call sort of a new unregulated or illicit market that we're seeing crop up as well. Um, so it's naive not to understand that we already have interstate commerce happening. Next slide. We really just don't have it happening for state regulated cannabis markets. And there are a lot of different ways that we could see interstate commerce come to those state regulated markets. As Professor Mykos talked about, we could see it come from the courts, from these dormant commerce clause cases. We could see it from come from Congress. Congress could um, enact policy to deschedule or to legalize with a regulatory framework. We could see the executive branch do the same. Or we could see it as Adam Smith and the Alliance for Sensible Markets have um, championed. We could see it from state to state agreements where a consortium of states get together and say, we want to open up our boundaries and set some parameters for doing that. Now, I'm going to talk more about this later, but obviously all of these different pathways through which interstate commerce could come um, to our country have very different ramifications on state programs, um, especially whether or not they come with a regulatory framework or whether states are left to do that on their own. The implications are broad and would impact equity, small business, existing licensed businesses of all types, and that's what we'll talk more about on as uh, more about as part of this webinar. Um, so that's it for my intro statement. Looking forward to diving deeper. Thanks, Tamar. Hey, thank you so much, um, Jillian. I turn it over to Jason. I will unmute. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Horst. I am uh, the managing partner of Horst Legal Counsel in the Bay Area here, as well as the president of the International Cannabis Bar Association. Uh, like Jillian, I, I will just make clear that um, INCBA completely disavows everything I'm about to say, um, but uh, but but I will um, take the opportunity as well to give a plug for um, an, an organization that has been um, incredibly meaningful in my life and career. Um, and um, INCBA is a, a group of about 700 lawyers, uh, professors, uh, law students paralegals around the globe uh, focused on cannabis law and i will just say if you have any interest in the subject and fall into one of those categories please reach out to me um, check out incba.org um, it's a great group um, 
And so if we can go to the next slide, you know, I think Professor uh, Mikos and um, Jillian both just expressed you know, why the courts are a likely place that um, that the interstate commerce discussion is going to start turning more and more. Um, I think, you know, of all of the four categories that, that, that Jillian put up as potential places where interstate commerce is going to come from, I think the reality is going to be a smattering of all of them. Um, and so, as indicated in what Professor Michael has put up on the screen, a prohibition on the import and export of a product from state to state is a facial violation of the dormant commerce clause in just about any context. And, and because of that, there's really going to be a threshold question that dictates a lot of what happens in federal court around interstate commerce and the dormant commerce clause. And that's, does the dormant commerce clause apply to the cannabis industry? There's been a case out of the First Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, 2022 called Northeast Patients Group versus Figueroa, where the court held that the Dormant Commerce Clause does preclude states from prohibiting import and export in, or I'm sorry, from prohibiting out-of-state ownership in the cannabis context. And um, I, I believe, Professor Micah, you're, you're, you're one of a, a number of you know, thought leaders on this topic who has opined that there's very little to distinguish Northeast Patients Group from the interstate commerce context and interstate sales context. Um, note, however, that there are a couple of recent cases out of the Western District of Washington where the court has held that because the cannabis industry is illegal and Congress has expressly attempted to prohibit the market entirely through the CSA, the DCC should not apply to the cannabis industry and have precluded preliminary injunctions to the plaintiffs challenging social equity programs in, in both of those cases. In a similar context in the Southern District of New York, different district court judges have gone in either of these two directions. And so you're, you're going to see over time this question is going to come up more and more, and if history is a guide, courts are going to go one way or another on that. Um, I do think, and I hope we'll get an opportunity to discuss, in my view, social equity programs that are thoughtfully constructed are going to be in incredibly distinguishable from the interstate sales context, and I think that the the way that they're being defended is is creating some of the challenges and some of the some of the split in, in on this question of whether the DCC applies to the cannabis industry, because in most contexts these programs are recognitions of wrongdoing by the state actors involved and attempts to remedy that wrongdoing, targeting that those the, that relief at the communities that were impacted. And so, you know, Professor Mikos referred to it as geographic discrimination. I, I don't know that I'd concede that. I think that they are, I think it's geographically targeted at folks that have been mistreated in the past um, as narrowly as, as possible. Um, and so then if, if we can go to the next slide, I think that, again, it is likely that more and more litigation around interstate commerce and the DCC is, is going to be coming our way. And th there are a few reasons for that, including that nothing suggests federal legalization is around the corner. Um, it doesn't appear likely that a second Biden administration or a second Trump administration is going to have full cannabis legalization as a priority. Congress it can't even pass a, a banking bill. Jason, I'm just going to jump in for a second oh, yeah. and bring you back to this when we get to the open discussion. Oh, sure. I don't, I don't want to steal your questions for later. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So you right. have questions to ask. Uh, you can jump to the next slide. Um, <laughs> anyhow, I, I think there are a variety of reasons. Um, I, I think that states are going to be reluctant to move forward without 
federal blessing, um, which could be slow in coming. Um, and even once that blessing comes, there you're going to have a dynamic where you know, the Dormant Commerce Clause exists because states have an impulse towards protectionist stances. Okay, and, Jason, I'm going to go on to that. We're going to come back to. I'm going to go all the way fast. Point, but I'm going to move Absolutely. on to the next speaker intro, so we have well, so we save enough time. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move on to um, Matthew Lee, General Counsel, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Jason. For California's Department of Cannabis Control, um, really happy to be here today. Uh, California and uh, some other states are in an interesting position because, like the folks in the uh, lawsuits that Jason mentioned, we are pursuing um, pathways towards state legal interstate commerce and cannabis um, for some of the reasons that Jillian mentioned. Uh, but we're doing it in a very different way. You know, we are doing it uh, in a um, voluntary and controlled way through our state's political branches, rather than uh, you know trying trying to throw open the floodgates in federal court. Uh, specifically, what Oregon and Washington and California have done is that each of those three states has passed a law that would essentially allow um, those states to negotiate voluntary state-to-state -state agreements with other states. Uh, to allow the import and export of state regulated cannabis, you know, subject to both states or to all states regulation uh, on terms that worked for everyone involved. You know, these, uh, the key points are the, are that these agreements uh, would be voluntary and they would be regulated. Uh, that makes sense for us for a few reasons. Uh, both policy and legal. Uh, I won't dive too much into either, but just want to preview the idea that, um, you know, as a as a cannabis regulator, I know all too well um, how hard our jobs are. And I'm certainly not trying to make anyone's job harder, which is why we are working so hard to, to meet people where they are. Um, but uh, I, I have the nagging suspicion that one of our one of the reasons our jobs are hard, uh, is that uh, we uh, have incompletely legalized cannabis. You know, we, the cannabis market that existed before, before legalization was an interstate market. Uh, and if that is the market we are working to legalize, the market that we are working to regulate, uh, at some point we're going to have to do that on, on an interstate basis. Uh, so, so happy to say more about that on a policy level as our conversation develops. On the legal side, I want to speak briefly to the fact that um, much of the reason that states haven't done this yet uh, seems to revolve around concern about what the federal response could be. Uh, Oregon and Washington and California, each of our state laws um, None can go into effect right away. Each each has several trigger conditions. Uh, e each of our laws can take effect um, in the event of certain federal action. California's law could also have taken effect if our state attorney general uh, was uh, willing to rule out the possibility of significant legal risk to the state itself if we move forward with this. Um, we requested that opinion from our attorney general last year. We got our response in December. Uh, it was not the response that we had quite hoped for, but it was it, it was an interesting response. You know, I, I the thing that is most interesting to me is just how much common ground there there is between us. So the short version there uh, is that although it was not an opinion that would let our law take effect right away, it was also not an opinion. Um, that would dissuade us from continuing to pursue ways um, that are, you know, pursue other ways that our law could take effect. Happy to say more about that down the road, but the short version is that, uh, you know, uh, we are in a place where we think interstate commerce makes sense, can be made to work, um, both for us and for partner states, and we think it can be done 
uh, in ways that don't need to antagonize the federal government. And we are looking forward to continuing to pursue those ways. Perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Ross. Well, thank you, Tamar, and uh, thank you to Cal Berkeley for hosting this conversation. I'm really excited for it personally. Um, so my name is Ross Gordon. I'm a co-founder of the National Craft Cannabis Coalition. And NCCC is a coalition of state level trade and advocacy organizations that predominantly represent uh, small and craft cannabis producers. Um, so our partners are in California, Washington State, um, Maine, Vermont, and New York. And collectively we represent about 1500 uh, small operating cannabis businesses. And I think one reason that's significant is that uh, our membership is NCCC um, comprises uh, states across uh, the country, both on the West Coast and the East Coast. And I think a lot of times these conversations about interstate uh, commerce, there's an element of regionalism, which sometimes isn't brought overtly into the conversation and, and how um, any interstate commerce framework or federal legal framework will affect different states. And so e even though we're really in different parts of the country, um, as NCCC, there's a lot of different uh, principles that we do agree on when it comes to interstate commerce. Um, personally, I'm based in California, um, where I'm policy chair of Origins Council as well, um, representing legacy cultivating communities in California, but really with NCCC trying to take um, a nationwide perspective and really um, moving forward with the consensus of all of these different uh, state level organizations. Um, so one thing that, that I think we really share in common, um, our NCCC uh, partners, um, is what we see in our state frameworks is probably the single most important factor which enables or detracts from our success as small businesses is the, the structure of the market in our states. Um, of course, there's a it's important that in the first case, it's possible to get permits to operate as a small business. But if you can get to that point, there's then this other question, which is, is the market structured in such a way that practically speaking, a small business that is licensed to operate can be successful? So I, that's often what we found in our state level frameworks. And that's the same perspective that we take when it comes to interstate commerce. So I think for us, the question is less uh, when interstate commerce or whether interstate commerce, really the most important question is how interstate commerce takes place. Um, because I, I think it's very possible we could get an interstate commerce framework and it can sound really good. Um, and the way that it's actually implemented could be in such a way that large businesses can access it and small businesses can't. Um, so that's really our overriding um, sort of principle that we approach this conversation from. I think one of the, the major risks um, that we see, and, and to some degree, it's it's an inevitable risk that we have to deal with because of the, the nature of, of where this conversation is, is the risk of uh, fragmentation and over complexity um, in terms of how interstate commerce rolls out, um, given that we have all of these different state level frameworks. And that could happen uh, because of state by state interstate commerce uh, between states. It could happen as a result of a suspension of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, and it's something which in any case, no matter how this, this rolls out, is, is going to need to be addressed. And, and one thing that I think is important for us um, is to really be objective about the, the range of state level frameworks that we have now. And understanding that there are some states where it's not even possible to operate as a small business. Um, and there are other states that are making significant efforts to um, be viable for small businesses to operate in. But that even in those states, there's mixed results. Um, and I think states are still learning a lot about how to do that in a productive way. And so I, I think the question is, how can we take the lessons in states um, about what is working well um, and really try to apply that and boost that um, within an a interstate commerce framework or a federal legal framework? Um, associated with the risk of fragmentation and over complexity, I think the risk of trade barriers is also one that needs to be taken really seriously. Um, many of our state level regulations that may on their face seem neutral, um, and interstate commerce will will turn into trade barriers. Um, and I think it'll be very um, challenging and very important to look closely as um, we look at harmonizing those rules, you know, what is really a neutral rule and what is is really a trade barrier between states. Um, with all that in mind, I, I think um, I'll just briefly say there's a couple of policies that we feel are, are really crucial. Um, first and foremost is uh, allowances for direct-to-consumer shipping for small producers within an interstate commerce framework. Um, we've seen this in alcohol as well. Um, I know one of the slides um, that uh, were shown earlier was from the Supreme Court case Granholm versus Heald, um, which is a Supreme Court case where the Dormant Commerce Clause was applied to. I, I'm just going to jump in and ask if maybe you can just like bullet point the top things or else we'll come back to this. And to one of my questions for you is what do you say? How do you suggest we do it? <laughs> Since you yes. said that's an important question, okay. question. But you could quickly bullet point or we can move on to the questions and we'll get to that one. 
Yeah, I'll very briefly bullet point direct to consumer shipping is really important. And, and the last thing I'll say is I think it's really important that our, our states um, really continue a focus on supporting small businesses within our states, even before interstate commerce, because if we can't get there, it's not going to make a difference. And just to give an example, here in California, we've got seven, 800 cultivators just in Mendocino County um, who are still fighting for their permits. And if we can't make sure that, that farmers and small businesses are able to get across the finish line in our state frameworks, um, it's not going to be helpful when interstate commerce opens. So just making sure we continue to focus on that as well. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay, I'm now we're now going to shift into a. I'm going to direct some questions at specific folks, but other people can also come in and answer or add. Um, and then I also want to note for the audience that everyone should feel free to put questions in the chat um, that we can raise up or at the end, we're going to then take some of those questions um, and Joanna will facilitate and and be, be to directly ask the panelists some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, so for, at the very beginning, I wanted to go a little bit back to the legal landscape of why we find ourselves in this strange <laughs> position that we do with interstate commerce um, and go back to you quickly, Rob. You did a good explanation, but then we heard a lot about how um, this would exist in no under industry. And this looks like a blatant violation of the dormant commerce clause, and it's causing problems for you know states in a number of ways. So can you quickly go back and touch on why we ended up in this position that we did? Why did states roll out these legal um, non-hemp, completely interstate markets when at the same time they're being told that now they're illegal? Well, I think there are two possibilities. Um, so the, the charitable possibility is states feared that if they started shipping product across state lines, that somehow that would bring down the wrath of the federal DOJ that the Federal Department of Justice doesn't care if you're selling uh, cannabis within Colorado confines, but it will start to care if you, you know, take that, uh, the moment you take that out of the state. Um, that's the, the charitable explanation. Um, the less charitable explanation is, well, you're in Michigan, how are you going to support a local cannabis industry? Well, the only way to do that is to engage in protectionism to keep product from California and Oregon from coming in um, because your local cultivators and processors, they just can't compete with that out-of-state product. So those are the, the two competing um, explanations for, for why we got it. Um, they, they may not matter ultimately. I mean, the court may say, even if you thought the DOJ would have cracked down on you, that's, that's still not a good reason for doing this. But I think those are the, the two explanations for why we have this weird market structure that we do today. One is protectionism. The other one is we just, we fear the, the wrath of the federal government. We had to do it this way. Okay, Jillian, did you wanna? No. No, okay. <laughs> I was, I actually was gonna pop back to Matt and ask quickly though, as a follow-up on that, cause it sounds like on the one hand, it's like, oh, it's protectionism. But then if the state of California wants to not be intrastate, but they're getting a response that, oh, you can't do that. How do we reconcile those two things that you can't be interstate, but you can't, at least the attorney general, there's arguments that you can't, you can't be interstate or intrastate. If any. Well, um, two, two thoughts there. Want to first unpack a little more what we mean by this idea of you can't do that. And, and, and then want to say a little more about the way I read our attorney general's opinion. So, um, in terms of what it means when we talk about, you know, you can't do that, I, I think it could mean at least two different things. Uh, one is the idea that um, the state itself might somehow be at risk in a way it would not be uh, under a purely intrastate market. I think another possibility is that um, because, of course, state licensees are always at risk, that to Professor Mykos's point, um, although state licensed activity is not currently a federal enforcement priority, maybe it would become more of a federal enforcement priority if it were crossing state lines. There are sort of, um, I think there are two problems with, with those ways of looking at the problem. On the first side, I think the key point is that um, from a constitutional and statutory 
perspective, this is all already interstate commerce. There is no difference uh, between what states are allowing right now uh, from a legal perspective under the Controlled Substances Act uh, and what states could be allowing in terms of conduct involving multiple states. The Controlled Substances Act specifically disavows the possibility of a difference. Like, I think you might have a severability problem there. Uh, and so there is, it is almost, frankly, it's a, it is almost a bit of folk wisdom, this idea that something legally special happens when you are crossing state lines. You know, it sounds like it could be true, but it just isn't. It's like the idea that they cannot arrest a husband and wife for the same crime. Like it, like it sounds plausible, it, but it's just not right. Uh, so there is, I think, a little bit of, you know, folk wisdom to dispel on the legal front, you know, whatever whatever risk states might face by authorizing this, and I think that risk is low to non-existent, we are living with that risk today. Uh, right. So, you know, to the extent we're worried about some new additional risk, I just don't see it. Um, the second point I would make uh, on in, in, in terms of federal enforcement priorities is that Listen, if, if it's 2012 and you're Oregon and there's, sorry, you're Washington and Colorado, uh, and you are the only two states that have legalized non-medical cannabis, um, you know, I, 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 I really do understand the idea that if, if, if you start to cause problems for other states outside your borders, the federal government might well regard that as an enforcement priority. But, but it's 2024, and I think the situation looks very different when you have, I think at last count, I think it's 38 states, the, you know, a, a, a large majority of states that have legalized cannabis in some form. And, and at that point, um, you, know, you really start to wonder whether the uh, mere fact of crossing or not cross, or uh, not crossing an imaginary line on a map, is, is really the difference um, between something that's a federal priority and not. Um, want to keep us moving, so I'll, I'll hold my sort of thoughts on the well, Attorney General's uh, opinion, but also happy to say more about that. Okay, too. that makes sense. Um, I, I, Tamara, if, if I could just, okay. just add to Matt's last point there, I, I think Matt probably better than just about anyone here can attest to the, the complexity of getting your hands around regulating this industry. And it, it's hard enough to do that, ma only making decisions about what you're going to do in your own state, let alone how you're going to play with others, without any federal regulatory structure in place, right? And so I, I think that's another reason why states have continued the sort of inertia that started in California, you know, back in 96 of putting it all in, a, in an interstate box. But I think Matt's absolutely right that from, from a legal perspective, from a constitutional perspective, it's all interstate commerce. Yeah. And that makes sense. And I especially appreciate the enforcement priority between states who agree with each other to jointly train. Um, I want to now come back to Jillian, because in your presentation, you had mentioned that, and the discussion that there's a lot of different ways that we could get to this uh, turning everything on its head and suddenly there's interstate commerce everywhere um, and what that means to a regulator from a regulatory perspective, um, the different ways that it could happen and how that will be different, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I think there are a lot of variables at play, but the biggest one is, is there a regulatory framework that comes with this or not? So if the dormant commerce clause leads to a case that leads to interstate commerce, there would almost certainly be no regulatory framework with that. And I think there'd be a lot of bumps in the road and it would almost be essential that Congress then act to put in place some minimum standards because as has been described aptly already, every state has set up their own market for lots of reasons. And I came into my work with the Cannabis Regulators Association to try to harmonize some of that. I thought that that would be very doable. But as it turns out, even something as simple as lab testing, where in mm -hmm. theory, lab testing should be very similar across states, except for maybe metals where things are different in the soil. 
Um, that's really hard to harmonize in a state by state approach because in a lot of states, it's literally their state legislature that has said, these are the pesticides that you can test for. So it requires getting you know 38 state legislatures to sing the same song if there's no regulatory framework. So we have talked a lot at CANRA about how it will be very important, however this comes to states, that there is some federal action, whether it's an executive order to name an agency to step into the space or Congress to name an agency to step into the space to set a minimum standard of frameworks. And then I think the states have to figure out what they can harmonize and how this will operate. This would, of course, be, in theory, much easier if there was a bit of a trial balloon that came out by having a few states say, we want to do this ahead of time. We want to figure out what this looks like. We want to drop the parameters. We want to figure out what data systems are needed, what um, you know, regulations really have to harmonize and which don't. I think that would give us all a lot of data if we see that happening. But I think at the end of the day, you know, every every regulator right now is having to think about how their market will change from interstate commerce, regardless of what those regulations look like. Um, because every market has set up, grow, processing, and retail, whether they are the right market for that or not. And I think one of the things, you know, I really... Um, I really liked your opening remarks, Ross, because I think one of the things that will stand the test of time in states is every state will have craft cannabis. That will be one of the things that states will be able to hang their hat on. There will always be pride in this was bought, you know, this was made, grown, et cetera, in my state. But will all states be big growth states? Probably not. Will all states, you know, have retail? Certainly. So I think it's um, the onus is on regulators right now to think about what parts of their market um, are going to be needed in an interstate commerce framework and how they can um, bolster those now, how they can build equity into those now, if that's a state priority, how they can um, underscore those. But a lot will come down to exactly what the regulatory framework is and what comes from feds and what has to be sort of bootstrapped by states. Thank you. Um, others, does anyone else want to weigh in on implications for regulators, depending on the route? <laughs> So I do think you know, there is there is an opportunity for chaos if this is happening through the courts and and I think that anyone who is contemplating DCC based litigation around interstate commerce needs to really contend with that and take that seriously because if the goal is a functional interstate market which it should be then simply blowing the doors off of you know the the, the hallway between states that do, doesn't create that functionality and so and i think that at the same time states for their part need to recognize that these artificial constructs that we've that we've created are not tenable are not sustainable and probably will start to fall prior to federal legalization. And, and because of that, I, I think that the work that, that Jillian and Canra are doing it, it, around this topic is, is so essential because states need to be talking to each other around what are the minimum thresholds, right? That there are some things that are going to have to be different, but how much can be resolved by simply saying, if you're gonna come into my state, you, you need to follow our rules. And, um, and I think testing is a really interesting pressure point around that, um, that that deserves some thought. But I, I do think that all parties involved need, need to be really self-honest as they go through this because um, the potential to break the industry really is there. Okay, yes, Matt, Matt. Yeah, I just want to echo that and underscore the fact that, you know, that, um, that possibility, I think, is a real factor in terms of why we in California and our partner states are pursuing the approach that we are. You know, uh, as a lawyer, I care a lot about keeping my department and my state ahead of potential legal risks. I, I, I don't want any, po any possibility of facing an order from a court a year or two from now that forces me to open the floodgates right now. I would much rather try to 
um, start working now to, to figure out how to get ahead of this issue, how to figure out a way that it can be made to work, not just for me, but for other state regulators, for other partners, uh, so that you know we never have to get to the point where we are facing any risk of chaos. So it, you know, I I see um, the approach that we are taking as an important prophylactic uh, to help guard against that um, you know more chaotic possibility. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, and if the, and so that that makes sense planning from a regulatory perspective. If we end up in a situation with the litigation where the band aid's kind of ripped off and we don't have Congress. Yes, Congress should immediately come in and deal with the problem, but as we know, they sometimes don't. Um, and so we're grappling with that. I'm wondering, and Ross, I want to come back to you to talk that you're touching on the end of your opening remarks about what the potential impact um, of that might be, um, both the opportunity creates, but the immediate impact on um, smaller businesses, um, maybe if folks have ideas about how it impacts the social equity programs and businesses, and whether it creates advantages for larger corporations or advantages for some other sector of the market, um, if it happens in that way. Well, I think I'd share the, the concern that if the courts were to open up interstate commerce without any sort of plan in place, um, I, personally, I'm not sure how to uh, predict how that would help or hurt small businesses, because my concern is it would be chaotic, as I think people have, have suggested. Um, so I, I think it's really important. And one reason I'm so appreciative of this panel is I completely agree that, that we need to plan for that outcome and not allow that to take place. Um, I'll say in terms of the, the specific elements of what is going to enable that framework to be viable or not viable for small businesses. Um, I think one element is how complicated is it? Um, and if you're creating a very complicated or very fragmented framework with lots of different rules in different places um, that enables very small rules to be implemented in different states that may look neutral but are actually trade barriers, um, I think that system is really going to benefit uh, larger operators, both because of the, the cost and complexity of complying with it, and also because the number of touch points that there will be to um, move those rules in a direction that's going to be hard for small operators to comply with. Um, I think a second uh, bucket of things that is really important um, is looking at how cannabis is transported across state lines. And some states have a mandatory uh, third-party distribution tier, and some states don't. Um, and I think that's one specific area that really needs to be looked at very closely um, from a small producer perspective. Um, what we've seen in the alcohol industry um, is that when there's mandatory third-party distribution, it can become very, very difficult for small producers to be able to actually transport and sell their products between states. Um, because if you're not scaled to be able to provide a very constant flow of product to a large distributor, if you don't have your own marketing resources to push that product forward, um, it's very difficult uh, to actually make sales across state lines. And that's something we think a lot about, about um, here in, in Northern California, which is that it would be great to be able to sell our products all across the country, but can we actually get the products there in a viable way? Um, so that's really where direct to consumer shipping um, for us becomes very, very important. Um, it's a very well-worn policy area. Um, it's really shown to be the, the policy area that is most impactful for small producers across a range of different industries. Um, and that's one reason we've really prioritized that is probably the single most important factor, um, which will influence the success or failure of small businesses. Thank you. Uh, Jillian? Um, yeah, thanks, Tamar. I, I just wanted to add, I think the potential for pandemonium and chaos is certainly there, but because of groups like CANRA that you know, we're convening regulators across 45 states and two territories, I think it's less likely. I think there would be an, a serious effort to cooperate. We already have a roadmap of things that we think would have to align for interstate commerce. You know, I think there is a potential likelihood that states would start to sort of get in their own box a little bit and try to figure out um, what piece of the pie they're going to take. But I've seen states that on paper wouldn't look like they should work together have amazing exchanges through the network at Canra. So I have a lot of faith that in working as a body of regulators and in working with our stakeholders, including groups like the NCCC, that we would try to lead with some thoughtful approaches, whether that was, you know, educating state legislatures rapidly about what was needed or pushing on Congress rapidly about what was needed or trying to bootstrap on our own. But I, I just want to raise that because I think that that does lessen the chance that there would be chaos. And every regulator knows that the worst thing for business of any size is chaos and unpredictability in the market. So there would be, a, I think, a huge effort to try to avoid that. 
Okay, that makes sense. A lot of alignment on trying to solve the problems. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I, I I will say there there's also an inherent chaos to, um, you know, states like California that have been generational leaders in the cannabis industry, and where still the majority of the nation's cannabis is grown, it, it, having their legal markets completely fail, right? And and I think that. A lot of the interest in interstate commerce that exists is a, a, a tacit acknowledgement, at the very least, that this this is one of the few things that needs to open up in order for some historical cannabis markets like California, like Oregon, to start to thrive in the way they should. And th there is likely to be an inherent reticence on the part of states that have opened up that now have their own local cultivation markets, right? I mean, I I, I do think that while it, I am not opposed inherently to litigation as a piece of the interstate commerce uh, of the puzzle of opening up interstate commerce, I think it needs to be done very thoughtfully. But I think for, you know, for example, Ross, right, you need, opening up direct to consumer sales. Um, I think does inherently benefit small businesses in a way that would be fantastic to have in an interstate market. I I, I wonder from the perspective of you know of Matt and Jillian, it, it, is that not something that is going to be closer to the top of the list of fear points for regulators and um, and things where where folks are going to be concerned about abuse and is that going to be something that's going to be inherently at the tail end? Right, I, I'm curious about that. I'll just say, I think we we already have that happening with cannabinoid hemp. So yeah. the reality is that as more of the market moves over towards cannabinoid hemp and more consumers move over towards that, regulators are becoming very familiar with those different systems. And that's also an underlying factor that we're not talking a lot about as part of this webinar, but we need to be because that is sort of putting a groove in the ground for how interstate commerce might exist. And right now, um, largely without regulation, which I think has huge risk to consumers. So I think that's definitely a piece of the puzzle that we need to be talking about as we think about interstate commerce for state regulated cannabis products. Okay. Um, I just want to lift up, there's a few questions in the chat from the audience, um, sort of around enforcement and enforcement priorities and some other things. So one, is there a precedent for the Department of Justice cracking down on cannabis across state lines? Um, what did the Department of Justice, the Cole memo, um, say, you know, it had the provision focusing on preventing diversion from cannabis from legal states to other states? Um, and it was rescinded, but is there still an unwritten approach that the Department of Justice is focusing on? And then also a question, if any of our experts know about how, uh, how if cannabis is rescheduled to Schedule 3, I think is sort of the premise for the question, but how other Schedule 3 drugs are shipped interstate, and if that changes on the scheduling, um, will that open up the ability to ship cannabis um, interstate if it's rescheduled to Schedule 3? And I'll just open this up to anyone. Matthew. So I'm 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 happy to speak to what I think were the first two questions, which are: um, Is there any precedent in terms of the U.S. Department of Justice cracking down on um, interstate cannabis? And, and also the sort of related question about the Cole Memo. Um, I think the short answer to the first version is that, although, of course, what we're doing here is inherently new, and so you will not find um, precedent squarely squarely on point, that, that is just inherent in um, the project of doing something new. The precedent that we do have, I think, points quite strongly in the other direction. You know, what, what we did see um, the Department of Justice do 20 years ago now in the Rage case um, was to, you know, this was a case out of California um, decided first at the Ninth Circuit by my old judge, Harry Pragerson, uh, and then by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the theory that California farmers advanced was that um, they were engaged in non-commercial and entirely intrastate activity and were therefore um, outside um, the constitutional scope of Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. 
Uh, and so the Controlled Substances Act could not constitutionally be applied to them. Uh, and the Department of Justice very successfully took the opposite view, you know, in line with um, what is candidly at this point, very well settled Supreme Court precedent going all the way back to Wickard in, in the in the New Deal, um, you know, very successfully defended the view that uh, there was there was not and did not need to be. Um, any carve out for that kind of, you know, interest state, even non-commercial interest state activity uh, when it comes to the scope of Congress's interstate commerce power. I think our position in many ways um, dovetails with US DOJ's position qu quite nicely. You know, our view also is that there is no um, legal doctrinal difference between these things. Uh, and so there does not need to be a reason for the Department of Justice to treat them differently when it comes to prioritizing the enforcement of, of federal law. Turning to the Cole memo and, you know, what little guidance we have in terms of where the uh, federal government's enforcement policy, uh, enforcement priorities might be. Um, I think the Cole memo is interesting because it is very much a product of its time. You know, it's very, very much a product of that era in, in 2013 that I um, spoke about a few minutes ago, where not that many states had legalized cannabis yet. You know, there was really no opportunity for this conversation to be happening as a matter of simple geography. And so what the Cole Memo actually says uh, is that there is a federal enforcement priority in terms of preventing the diversion of marijuana from states where it is legal under state law in some, in some form to other states. Uh, and how, how you read those words are very, is, is a very interesting question, uh, and I think there are reasons that you could not answer that question very precisely in, in, in 2013. Um, but I, you know, especially in the context of where we find ourselves now in, in 2024, I am much more inclined to read that as a prohibition against, you know, illegal, unsanctioned diversion than I am uh, to read it as a blanket prohibition against all interstate commerce, even state regulated, even consensual in any form. Thank you. Um, Robert, did you want to add? Yeah, all I would um, all I would add to that uh, is concerns the the rescheduling issue. Um, that was the the second part of your your question. Um, it would have really no impact at all. Uh, on interstate commerce in uh, marijuana, to use the the federal terminology, um, yeah, the the rescheduling, all of the the news that it's drawing, uh, the HHS recommendation to reschedule marijuana to to schedule three, um, it's going to have almost no impact whatsoever on the state licensed industry. Um, it, it's true that you can legally produce and sell a Schedule Three substance. It doesn't necessarily violate the Controlled Substances Act. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to do that. You have to register with the DEA, for example, to, to manufacture a Schedule, schedule Three drug or to sell it. Um, but even if you jump through all those hoops with the DEA, then you're over uh, violating the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act um, because HHS, when it issued its recommendation, it made it very clear that while it was saying marijuana belonged on Schedule 3 under the CSA, it wasn't approving the drug. Uh, and it remains unlawful under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to sell uh, a drug that hasn't been approved by the FDA. Um, so you're kind of out of the frying pan into the fire. There, there are some analogs. There are um, phenobarbital, phenobarbital uh, is probably the, the closest substance I can think of to, to where marijuana will be post rescheduling. It's a Schedule IV controlled substance. It's an old drug used for epilepsy. It was never approved by the FDA up until about a year ago. They approved it for um, like epileptic uh, seizures in, in infants. Um, people did sell that. They sold it interstate, but I think they just got away with it uh, because nobody realized that phenobarbital had never been approved. I think every bank, every big company like FedEx, if you try to ship your products across state lines, they're going to know uh, cannabis has never been approved by the FDA. It's unlawful to sell this across state lines. Um, so I think that the rescheduling won't have any impact on this. 
full descheduling or full federal legalization would because it would take off the board really the one excuse states have been able to raise uh, in some of the the cases that that Jason mentioned one excuse states can give for why the dormant commerce clause doesn't apply to this market is maybe congress has suspended it congress can do that it's a weird constitutional provision um some states have argued hey by criminalizing the sale of of marijuana congress has effectively given us free reign to discriminate against outsiders if congress legalizes the sale uh, federally not just under the controlled substances act but the food drug and cosmetic act you take that argument off the table and yeah you know, any credible claim that the dormant commerce clause doesn't apply goes out the window but rescheduling itself i i don't think would do anything like that Okay, um, Jason, I'm going to open up to you, but I'm going to throw one more question in the mix in case you sure. want to answer this one too. And uh, Ross and Jillian, you might have some thoughts on this too. So we talked a little bit about the differing uh, cannabis-specific regulations and how they might clash. Um, someone in the audience asks a question about broader, like the regulatory environment in states generally and the cost, and they raise up CEQA in California, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, which can be difficult to comply with uh, in the context of cannabis and other contexts. And so the question is, if we open it up and some states have a very difficult regulatory environment with a lot of regulations and costs associated with it, and then we have other states like Oklahoma that has, as far as I can tell, zero regulation <laughs> or, or very minimal sort of requirements and costs, how does, will California or those states be at a competitive disadvantage? How will those things uh, change, I guess, in, as if we move into an interstate market. Ross? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And one thing I, I feel like oftentimes when we talk about hemp, there's a lot of conversations about um, trying to equalize or rationalize the way that hemp and cannabis are regulated, understanding that they're, they're the same plant. Um, oftentimes hemp can be converted into intoxicating forms that feel more like what we would normally classify as cannabis. And so I feel like a lot of the conversations around that focus on how do you equalize or rationalize the regulations between cannabis and hemp, um, typically at the level of distribution, sales, and product standards. Um, one thing that I think is less often introduced into that conversation is how do you equalize or rationalize the production of cannabis and hemp? Um, so right now, hemp is considered an agricultural product. It's regulated under the United States Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, cannabis, of course, is prohibited at the federal level, and it's also very, very highly regulated by most state governments. Um, there's really no comparison to the way that hemp is regulated in California, for example, and the way cannabis is regulated. The, the barriers to cannabis uh, operation as, as a producer are much, much higher. Um, and off, many of the, the elements that are applied to that, such as the way that CEQA is applied to cannabis cultivation in California, go far above they, they would be for any other form of agriculture or for hemp. Um, so in addition to direct-to-consumer shipping, one thing is, as NCCC that we've really tried to emphasize is the importance at a baseline of regulating cannabis cultivation as agriculture. It is agriculture, just like hemp is agriculture, just like other products are agriculture. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that states might have you know, some differences in how they treat uh, cannabis production, but some baseline where cannabis is considered to be agriculture for us is a really important component of that conversation. Okay, I want to, I see Jillian and Matthew's hands, but I also want to see if Jason, you, because I stopped you before you were about to talk, if you had a comment. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I defer to Ross on this eco question. I, I was going to to note that, you know, that you on the question around rescheduling, that you you can theoretically go through the new drug approval process that that, that Rob had, had sort of alluded to, um, but you you don't have some of the natural incentives to do so that typically exist because you're not going to get the exclusivity that you normally get in that context in the context of cannabis right you're still going to have a dispensary just down the street from you know the fda approved drugstore okay jillian and then uh matthew yeah, first I feel like I I'm channeling the Oklahoma regulator who would say that they do indeed have regulations. Yeah. Their regulations different than California certainly. Um but I think the big question I have is would it be a race to the top or a race to the bottom? Um and I think a lot of that depends on the market size um in the location that has certain regulations. So it's the same reason that like I can buy a couch or a mattress here in Washington state 
and it's flame retardant free because that's a policy that California has in place and California is a huge market. So I do think what's at risk is that the really big markets drive the policy for everybody if there's not some unification or some understanding that minimum standards will be accepted and you can choose to go above and beyond that to get certain credentialing in the state or whatever that may be. So I think all eyes on kind of what the big, big cannabis markets are doing. Um, and it'll be important to, to think carefully about how that will impact smaller markets. And there may be operators that choose not to play in certain markets because it's it doesn't pencil out for them. And again, I think this comes back to what's the constant across all markets. I think it will be that they all have craft cannabis, that they all have, you know, made in my state, whatever complies with whatever's in my state. So um, yeah, race to the top or race to the bottom. I hope for the sake of consumers, it's a race to the top while not um, you know, preventing small business and industry from being able to operate. Makes sense. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, just, just to dovetail with Jillian, you know, I would reframe this issue somewhat more broadly as, you know, different states are going to have different substantive regulatory standards. Uh, how are we going to make those different regulatory standards work in the context of an interstate market? And listen, I think that issue is real, but I don't want to overstate that issue. That, that's an issue that we already have in everything else. Uh, and you know, I, I care a lot about avoiding a race to the bottom. I, I do not think this needs to be a race to the bottom. What we've seen in the you know, agreement-based framework that we are already pursuing is that there are you know, strong protections to make sure that you know, state laws protecting workers, protecting the environment, protecting consumers, protecting other members of the public. You know, we want those. And, you know, part of the goal here is to bring the unregulated interstate market into a regulated framework and then have a regulated framework that actually works at protecting people. Uh, so I think the issue is real, but but I think it is solvable. And I don't think it needs to um, you know, I, I would just echo Jillian's point that I, I, I don't think you need to see this as a race to the bottom. I mean, the, the only other thing I would add is that there's actually a sense in which I think um, this issue can uh, help strengthen important state laws protecting workers and consumers and the, and the environment and the public and so on. Um, this is a way to grow the pie. You know, as a as a cannabis regulator, I am keenly aware of the fact that there are, you know, many difficult trade-offs to be made in, in terms of, you know, how an industry is regulated. Because on one hand, uh, you know, you would prefer that people be in the legal market as opposed to the illegal market, obviously. And so you, you need to make the legal market viable. And on the other hand, the whole point of having them in the legal market is that then they are, you know, as discussed, um, heavily regulated. And so there's this inherent tension, uh, this, this inherent tightrope between, you know, uh, making it viable to be in the legal market and making sure that the legal market is heavily regulated. Um, interstate commerce is one place where I actually am not sure I see that trade-off. You know, I, I am not sure why I, as a state regulator, care um, where, where cannabis comes from. You know, I care that cannabis is safe and that the workers responsible for producing it were treated fairly and were safe and were paid well. And I care that it's been tested and I care that, um, you know, it, it was grown in conditions that do not degrade the environment. And I care about not fueling transnational criminal organizations. I care about lots of other things. Um, but when it comes to interstate commerce, this seems like an opportunity um, to escape some of those trade-offs for once. And that's one of the reasons I think we're interested in pursuing it. Okay, um, thank you. I'm going to raise up, I'm going to just put out two last questions to everybody, whoever wants to um, answer. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about what happens if there's a court decision and a lot of people said chaos, but hopefully controlled chaos, because a lot of people are thinking about it, working on it. But maybe congressional staffers and Senate staffers have been listening to our webinar and they're like, oh, we need to prevent chaos. So we're now going to draft up a federal legalization bill that addresses this issue. I'm curious, um, you know, states, as, as Robert 
explained in the beginning of this overview, they can't limit interstate commerce or have protections policies, but Congress can. Like it's up to them to say how much or how little interstate commerce can take place if it chooses. So my question is, does anyone think uh, if they were to act to remedy this, that they should open it up like other commercial commodities and other commerce, or are there limits that should be placed, particular programs that should be protected? Way, is there a way to see a new type of interstate market for cannabis and what would that look like just as a policy matter, I guess, and a regulatory matter? matter. And then finally, if anyone has thoughts on as we move into interstate commerce, what that also means for foreign commerce and if that will be allowed um, or not uh, as, as we move in this direction. And um, we'll go, why don't we go to Robert first because we haven't heard from you in a little while and then we'll pop around for everyone to give a chance to, to get their thoughts. Sure. So um, Congress can, as, as I think I mentioned before, Congress can turn that dormant commerce clause principle off. Congress can authorize states to engage in protectionism, um, as much protectionism as they want. So one thing that, that I've suggested uh, in the past is that Congress at least temporarily suspend the dormant commerce clause, let states continue doing what they're doing, um, which would also green light what states like California are at least contemplating. It would let states kind of, or as Jillian puts it, float that trial balloon. So a couple of states, if they wanted to get together, they could figure out how would this actually work? How would we develop a tracking system where we can monitor from seed to sale product that is grown and processed in a couple different states? Um, so you, you could have Congress kind of preserve the status quo, make sure there's not chaos, um, and let states kind of figure out how to do this. Float that out there for a few years, maybe put a sunset clause on it so it doesn't become permanently entrenched. Uh, and Congress has do done this with other industries. Insurance is a good example. Retail banking is another example where Congress said, we're going to suspend the dormant commerce clause, but if states want to engage in this, if they want to figure it out, uh, they have our blessing, they can go ahead and do so. So that's one approach that, that I would encourage you know, a congressional staffer to take. Thank you. Uh, Jason? So I, I guess I, I would just comment on, you know, on, on that concept that the cannabis industry is, is a lot different inherently than either the insurance or, or retail banking world, obviously. And so I mean, just from a practical perspective, I, I don't I don't know that there are any precedents in a consumable products industry for Congress taking this step or anything like it. And so I think it's, number one, it's very unlikely. And, and I think that, you know, a comment was made earlier around, I, I think by Jillian, around looking at what sectors of the market are being protected and, and, and make sense to protect, right? I, I, I mean, because facilitating a local industry across all market sectors is not necessarily an inherent good, right? If if someone in Minnesota wanted to start a commercial, you know, orange production company, right? They, they, they would have some structural challenges in doing so because of how much it would cost to grow each orange, right? And, and you can think about the reaction would be if someone passed a law in Minnesota saying you can't bring out of state oranges and allow them in, you know, the, the fact that you, that Florida can ship its oranges to Minnesota doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of locally owned fruit stands in St. Paul, right? And, and so the, the industry is not, does not equal agriculture, does not equal the production side. Um, and so I, I think that's something that's important to, to keep in context as this discussion goes forward. Thank you. Um, Matthew? I just wanted, not to derail us, I just wanted to very briefly answer the question about foreign commerce, you know, whether pursuing a pathway towards interstate commerce implies pursuing foreign commerce. In the event that we have any colleagues from the federal justice or state departments here today, I want to say absolutely not, no way. Completely different issue, completely different issue legally. 
um, not, you know, one does not at all imply the other. Um, qu quite the opposite in some ways, you know, going back to some of the, some of the points that Jason and um, Professor Mykos have made, you know, these sort of ordinary situation uh, when we're talking about the dormant commerce clause and the regulation of interstate commerce is that, you know, the, the default state is that states do not get to um, prohibit interstate commerce. That is not normally within a state's police power. Uh, what we are doing uh, in our gradual controlled way in the interstate commerce context is sort of inching state power um, the role of the state back more closely towards its normal baseline. In the foreign commerce context, you know, whenever you're talking about international affairs, foreign policy, international trade, um, the baseline is, again, that that is, you know, a, a uniquely federal sphere and uh, nothing we are doing here implies otherwise. So short answer is a hard no um, for all sorts of reasons. Okay, we're gonna to go to Ross and then Jillian, and then I see Jason has his hand up again. So Ross. Well, I was also gonna to touch on international commerce and I'm really glad that you went before me because as also one of the non-lawyers on this panel, um, obviously it's a very, very technical legal issue that I will not pretend to understand in detail. Um, but what I do wanna say maybe in a, a very broad way about international commerce is that I do feel it's important that as we design the nature of interstate commerce, we're cognizant of the potential and likelihood of a potential international commerce. Um, and in the same way that, you know, our state frameworks right now have not really been set up with a ton of thought being given to interstate commerce. I think we shouldn't make that same mistake again and set up our interstate commerce frameworks without thinking about what international commerce will look like. And to a point you made earlier, Jillian, that, you know, in an interstate commerce framework, really many states, if not all states, will have an interest in promoting craft cannabis. I think it becomes even more important when we talk about international commerce. Because if we're really talking about commodity scale production, um, when we start looking at that production occurring in other countries and being imported into the United States, I think there's a real question about whether commodity scale production will be viable in the United States, period. Um, and at the very least, it's going to create some significant headwinds. So I, I do think that's something we should just keep in mind as we're having these conversations. Thanks, Ross. Julian, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to come back to what you said about sort of what should Congress be thinking about. Um, first, I do think that there needs to be a federal agency that is responsible for this, that is working to set a minimum threshold of standards. I also Which think- one? I should have, that was another question. Which, Which one? One? I feel like that's a topic for another webinar, because okay. that's not the answer, but happy to come back and chat about that. I think one of the things that will be will continue to be hard for regulators is if we continue to see discordance between the same or very similar products when derived from federally legal hemp versus derived from cannabis. That will be extremely difficult. And I would caution against Congress, any federal agency creating two separate frameworks for interstate commerce, one for you know, cannabinoid hemp and one for cannabis, because I think you'll end up in a situation where you know maybe you have a two milligram THC beverage and if it's made from hemp, it can be sent to all 50 states. And if it's made from cannabis, it has a different set of rules and maybe it can only be sent to five states or it has to adhere to this that gets really difficult for regulators to actually execute and implement. The other thing that I think is desperately needed are standards. Um, and I don't think those standards will come out of a federal agency. I think those will come from regulators and standard making bodies. And I think some of those standards have the potential to protect some of the things that states care deeply about, like equity. So if there is a standard definition for what does it mean to be an equity operator or equity applicant, that will make it much easier as soon as interstate commerce happens for the states that have that built into their models to say, hey, we're adopting this definition. And now, you know, if there was any question about the dormant commerce clause in our issue, like it's any person who meets these criteria from any. So I think we need to have a really big focus on making sure those standards are good and right before we get into the situation and it's a scramble. That makes sense. Um, okay, we have about 90, I think we're almost at the end of the webinar. So Jason, I want to give you a quick last word, probably for about 30 seconds, and then we'll have about one minute left if we're ending at 150. Or end I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I, I, I mostly wanted to just note that everything that we've talked about here, for the most part, is really contemplating pre-legalization interstate commerce. And 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 I think that 
there are important opportunities there, right? California is much more powerful in a pre-legalization rubric uh, around shaping what interstate commerce looks like than it is in a congressional discussion around what interstate commerce is going to look like. And so, you know, I, I just, I, I think that there is a real incentive to, to get this done. And if it, and, and I think a lot of the people here share a lot of values around what that looks like in their head. And I think that's, that sort of a framework is much more likely if we get this done in and create a national market pre-legalization than if it waits for Congress. Great, that's an excellent final point. Um, so should I send it back over to you, Michael, to close us out or we have time? Sure, yeah. Um, well, thank you, Tamar, for moderating. That was very excellent. And um, I learned a lot today. So I really want to say a deep thank you to all the panelists who not only took time out of their day, but also the time to prepare for this and meet with us beforehand. And also for the ongoing work that you're doing to help shape some of these issues um, in this pre-legalization moment <laughs> at the federal level, anyhow. Um, so, uh, but with that, um, I want to give a big thank you also to the audience who, who uh, take time out of their day too. And, um, and please keep posted. Uh, we'll put this up at crc.berkeley.edu um, for um, you to pass on to others if you care um, too. And otherwise, uh, keep posted and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. Thanks to Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good to Thanks. see you all.